I love having the uh, the folks who volunteer and come up here and do the praise team every week. They um, help make our job easy, as does Mike and Chris back there doing all the work that they do. So thank you very much. And thank you, Lamar, um, for this another opportunity to speak. Uh, he's out in the lobby in case he needs to run out quickly. <laughs> in case it doesn't go well, right? <laughs> when, he, he, when he came to me and he said, um, I need you to speak for Labor Day weekend, two things came into my head, and this is the truth immediately. The first thing was this scripture, and I had the, the scripture, I had the title, I had everything when he said, I want you to speak on Labor Day. And the second thing I thought was, that's pretty smart to have me speak on the day that pretty much everyone will be gone. Um, so kudos to you, uh, Lamar, but either way, it is an honor uh, to speak this morning on this passage. We're out of Matthew uh, chapter 9. If you have your Bibles or your iPads, your phones, I encourage you to turn there. If not, Chris, of course, um, has the uh, verses on the screen. For those of you watching on Facebook, join with us. I pray that you'll get your, uh, your Bibles out, your notepads, and uh, worship right along with us through the next few minutes as we look at this passage. Matthew chapter 9, we're going to start in verse 35. This is a, a rich, rich piece of scripture. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Uh, with school starting, um, the kids are at home some because they're doing digital learning until next week. So. I've been home with some of the kids some of the time. Sometimes they go with Linnell. And so they'll ask us questions. How do you do this? How do you do this? And Emma right now in grammar is really trying to nail down what is the subject and what is the verb and what is this and that, what is fiction and non. She still struggles with what is fiction and nonfiction. She can't quite get that together. But um, if we were to look at the main subject of this text, I'd have to say it was the harvest. We're seeing where the Lord of the harvest is sending out workers into the harvest. We see that the harvest is plentiful, right? We see that in two different occasions, just in this one passage. So it would uh, probably uh, do justice to focus mainly this morning on the main character that is over the main subject, and that is the Lord of the harvest. Matthew and Luke both call him the Lord of the harvest. So the first question is, who is the Lord of the harvest? And the answer, God. God is the Lord of the harvest. Now in the Old Testament, if we go Old Testament, the harvest, almost every time it is mentioned, is mentioned more as a judgment, right? So the Lord of the harvest would be looked at more as a grim reaper. But through the Holy Spirit here in Matthew, we see the harvest as something completely different. Jesus recognizes the harvest as those whom God has appointed to salvation, and they are ripe unto harvesting. We also see that Jesus has compassion for them and we'll look at that a little deeper in a moment. Now that we know the who, let's look at the what. What does that mean that he is the Lord of the harvest? It simply means that God is master over the harvest. He is the beginning and he is the end of harvest time. He is the final say when it comes to the harvest. To understand this better, we're going to look at a few verses, and this should help shed a little light on how significant that truth really is. A lot of times, and I do the same thing, we will read scripture and we'll come to something that's familiar. And this is familiar, right? We've pretty well all heard this piece of scripture. 
and we'll kind of skim through it and we'll go and, and then we'll come to something else and then we'll move on and five or ten minutes down the road we've pretty well forgotten what was there so I want to take some time and kind of unfold unpack what it means for God to be the Lord of the harvest so Chris did a great job putting all of these verses up. We're going to run through these fairly quickly. Let's take a look. In Romans 8, 28, here's what it says. God, Lord of the harvest, God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love God. And here it is, those who are called according to what? His purpose. What did I say? He is the beginning and he is the end. It is all about him. In Ephesians 1 11, also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to what? His purpose. You're going to see that a lot. Who works all things after the counsel of his will. 2 Timothy 1 9 says who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. This is important, not according to our works, but according to, there it is again, his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Wow. Second Thessalonians 2.13 could not be clearer. Listen to this. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith and truth. So if the harvest are those souls, and it is God choosing them from the beginning for salvation, then God is the Lord of the harvest. John 6 63 through 65, has Jesus speaking these words of God's sovereignty? It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, this is Jesus we're quoting, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from who? The Father, the Lord of the harvest. Look at Acts 13, 48. This is a fascinating verse. It's probably the clearest verse on God's sovereignty when it comes to salvation. Listen to this. When the Gentiles heard this, okay, stop there. Heard what? The Gentiles have just heard that the gospel is now open to them, right? That's an amazing thing for them. It's, it's always been for the Jews, for God's chosen people, and now it has been opened up to the Gentiles. Listen to this. They began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Wow. As many as had been appointed. Appointed by who? God. The Lord of the harvest. Now, listen. I'll be the first to admit that this is a tough teaching. Thinking as God sovereign over salvation can be tough to swallow. If I said to you, is God sovereign I would assume almost everyone in here would say yes. Is God sovereign over creation? Uh, yes. Is God sovereign over your marriage, your finances? Uh, that we're going to get resounding yeses all across the room. But once you come to salvation, for some reason, all of us, me included, tend to pull back on the full sovereignty of God when it comes to salvation and I did that for a long time to be honest I was just saved last month was 22 years ago but I was singing in church since I was four so most of my theology came from songs came from gospel songs came from 
the hymn book. That is where I got most of my theology. And that's not always good. We have great hymns out there, but there are some that just simply aren't biblical. They're, they're wonderful to sing and they're fun and we love them. But when you mirror them with scripture, they just don't match up. And when I was going through this, this has been a couple of weeks now, I was reminded of when we were in the sanctuary, and this is a long time ago. I was 14, I think, and I'm 22 now. Um, Harold Wallace was, was here, and he wanted to put together a quartet, right? And I'm sure there's a cassette tape of that quartet somewhere. Um, but it was me and Walter, and I think Harold sang, and I don't remember who else. I think I sang tenor then. Um, but the song we sang, I'll never forget it, was There's a New Name Written Down in Glory. Y'all remember that song? It's a great song, wonderful melody, great harmonies, great rhythm, easy to dance to, horrible theology. What the song implies is you were saved and then your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But as we discussed the last time I had the opportunity to speak, the Bible says your name, if you're a believer, your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. So the picture that song paints is you're in a revival and the preacher is preaching hot and you're on the fourth verse of Just As I Am and God is just waiting to see if you come up front and shake the preacher's hand and sit on the front row and fill out the card and as you're filling out your membership card, God is writing your name in the book of life. And that's just simply not the case, not if we're gonna stick with the Bible. If that's how it goes down, then you and I are the Lord of the harvest, right? It takes it out of God's hands, but he is the Lord of the harvest. See, we can't do it because we're dead right? You were dead. I was dead. When Nicodemus is asking Jesus a great question, how can I be born again? Or how can I be saved? Jesus says you must be born again, right? Nicodemus confused says, so what do I climb up into my mother's womb and I'm born a second time? He didn't understand how that worked. Although Nicodemus was breathing in and breathing out, he was dead, dead in his trespasses, dead in his sin, and just like me, just like you, dead. Which brings us to this remarkable piece of scripture. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. Listen to this. It starts off with that truth. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So what he's saying is you were dead. You formerly walked in all of these things which sons of disobedience are now walking, right? You were dead. Verse 3 says, among them, we too, okay, Paul's talking about himself. We too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. When I hear someone, I've heard preachers say this. When I hear someone say, you know, honestly, I believe everyone's born good. You have to learn to lie. You have to learn to hate. You have to learn to, to bully. These are things you have to learn. But everyone is just is, is born good. If we were in a good society, they would stay good and things would progress. That's not what the Bible says. By nature, children of wrath, even as the rest. Two most powerful words in Scripture is in verse 4. But... God, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. There's a few nurses here. Have you ever seen a dead person give themselves CPR? No. You're dead. But God, God made you alive together with Christ. Wow. He is the Lord of the harvest. And although that is tough to comprehend, tough to swallow, still after two decades of me um, believing this, still tough to wrap my brain around it, that God would choose me, that God would choose me before the foundation of the world with all the knowledge he had of what I would be and what I would become and my faults and my failures, that God would choose me. But honestly, it takes a lot of the pressure off, right? If you're one of those that are going into the harvest, God's done the hard work. You are there to, to plant or you're there to water what has already been planted. God provides the growth. That's what Paul says. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered. God caused the growth. So when you share the gospel with someone, you are merely the one who plants the seed or waters what has already been planted. It is the Spirit's job to then draw that person to a, a saving relationship. The Spirit of God draws them. Christ redeems them. God begins and finishes every good work. So you have the easy job, right? You get to share the good news. You have the opportunity to disciple. The hard work has already been done by the Lord of the harvest. So we see that God is the Lord of the harvest. We also see the compassion of the shepherd. In verse 36, it says, seeing the people, he had compassion on them. Jesus. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And this is a remarkable piece of scripture. If you look at all of chapter 9, I would encourage you to do that when you get home later this afternoon. Look at chapter 9. It was a busy day for Jesus. We see him going through the towns, villages, the synagogues. He is teaching, preaching, and healing. In one chapter, we see him heal a paralytic, call and teach a new disciple, raise a little girl from the dead, heal the woman with the issue of blood, and heal a mute, demon-possessed man while teaching and preaching. But in the middle of all this, the scripture says Jesus has compassion on them. And the word there is very interesting. It's not like we would think of someone just having compassion. In other words, they just they have feelings towards them. They kind of hurt for them. This is a much different word. The word that they use in the Latin literally means the inner parts. The bowels is actually the, the word used. In other words, when Jesus saw the people and saw the distress they were under, he felt it in his gut. You ever been there? Have you ever gotten news so bad that it made you sick? Mama says that all the time. She'll tell me something and she'll say, oh, that just makes me sick to my stomach. Right? We've all said that. And you feel it in your gut. Just imagine if Jesus is fully God, which he is, and fully man, which he is, that means the perfect compassion of God is trapped in a human body. And so Jesus feels the utmost perfect selfless compassion in his gut. It is a gut-wrenching experience. 
What a loving, compassionate Savior. This is the compassion he felt as he looked over a field of souls that were ripe unto harvest. And at the end of this chapter, he alludes to something. It's a stunning acknowledgement. He doesn't want to do this on his own. Jesus has been up since early morning teaching, preaching, healing. Yet there is still a crowd clamoring for his attention. Twelve men accompany him, but they have been no help at all up to this point. So what's Jesus' command to the twelve? He's tired. He's been healing. He's been raising from the dead. He's been teaching and preaching. He's been going from town to town to town. So what is Jesus' command to the twelve? To begin to witness? No. To start taking some of the teaching responsibilities? No. To start healing? To lighten the load? No. Jesus' command was to pray. Pray for what? Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send workers into the harvest. So the final thing we see is there is a prayer with a purpose. In Matthew 9, 38, there is a command from Jesus regarding the great need of millions who have never heard the gospel. When he said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, he commanded his disciples, therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The word for send that Jesus uses is not the typical word for send. This is fascinating. But rather, and I had to Google this to make sure I was saying it correctly. The Greek word is ekbalo, which is the same word Jesus uses when he casts out demons. Also, Jesus himself was cast into the wilderness by the Spirit of God. Same word. So this is not a great suggestion, but a passionate casting forth by the Spirit of God so that laborers are compelled to go. My question when I read this, why would you not just pray for someone's salvation? It seems like you could cut out the middleman, right? Why are you praying for God to send someone to go to someone? Why can't you just pray that they be saved, right? So I'm going to go down here, Chris. I'm going to use this as an illustration. Gidget, will you come here? And... Did you all see that my family's here, by the way? I've had several of you come up and say, that is so kind that your family came here to support you. No, no. They're here for birthday cake, which we'll have here in just a moment. But they're also in this room, assuming I'm going to absolutely blow it, and they'll have something to talk about for years to come. So to, they're not here for But Gidget, if you'll come up here in the middle, and we're going to talk about this real quick. Why would you not, why would you not pray for? She probably did this on purpose. Okay. So let's take Gidget, and she's just someone that you know at work. She's someone you know at school. She's someone you see once a week, or you get to talk to her a couple of times, or you have lunch together on occasion. And Gidget is one of those people that's very kind. She's nice. She's polite. Um, and, and you like Gidget, right? Let's just assume. <laughs> and so you don't believe 
Gidget goes to church, you haven't heard her talk about it. You're not really sure if she's saved. The first thing we normally do, normally, there are exceptions, is when we pray, we pray for Gidget, right? We'll pray for Gidget. God, you know Gidget. Um, if she's not saved, Lord, would you save Gidget? Would you do that? Would you, would you say, I mean, that's, that's our prayer, right? And then some weeks go by and you may drop something in the conversation about your church. And Gidget is very kind and nice and, but she doesn't give you any information. She doesn't say, well, I go here and, you know, I've been saved since I was this year's old. And, and you go home and you pray and you're praying a little more fervently for Gidget and you're saying, oh God, she's so kind and she's, she's always helping and volunteering and uh, would you just, Lord, if she's not saved, would you save her? Would you do that? And a few weeks go by and homecoming's coming up, right? It's a great time to invite somebody to church. Food, music, everyone's happy. And so you go to Gidget and you say, hey, I go to First Baptist Williams. We've got homecoming. I don't know if you go anywhere, but you know, it's going to be a ton of food, great cooks. Uh, the music's going to be great. Our choir director is so good looking. Her husband, not so much. Um, would you like to come? And Gidget says, Sure. Yes, she comes. She comes to homecoming, right? And you think, all right, good. She's going to hear the gospel. This is great. So you go home and you pray. Oh, God, I pray that sermon touched her. I pray she was listening to the songs. Oh, God, if you could just save her. And you keep that prayer up. A few weeks go by. Christmas goes by. You haven't heard anything. She didn't come back. And you're so distraught because God won't save her. But you know what all of those prayers have allowed us to do? They've allowed us to keep at arm's length from having to do the work ourselves right? What have we been praying? God, I pray she hears that sermon. God, and you may even say, hey, I love this movie. And you give her a Christian movie and oh God, let that movie penetrate her heart. And, and then weeks turned into months and on down the line. And then you become so frustrated and upset and you just don't know why God won't, won't do what he's supposed to do. What if you did this? What if after meeting Gidget, and she was on your heart. What if you went home and you prayed, Lord, could you send someone her way that, that knows the gospel, that is saved? Could you just put somebody in her path that would be willing to share the gospel? Oh, could you do that, Lord? Just whoever you put in her path. Well, after a day or two, you realize I'm the only Christian in her path. I'm it. I'm the worker, right? If you pray that with an Isaiah heart, here am I, send me, it'll change everything. And so you just come to Gidget and you say, we've kind of gotten to know each other a little bit. I was just wondering, my pastor was talking about heaven last week, and it just got me to thinking, what do you understand it takes for a person to go to heaven? You see how simple that is? And whatever answer she gives, you know where she stands. And then you have that opportunity to share the gospel. Go sit down. You did a great job. It changes your outlook. It changes your perspective when you become the worker, right? And we think, ah, oh, but that's embarrassing. Oh, that's, I just don't know if I'm going to be able to do that. I don't want to offend anybody. It's going to be much more offensive when all of this wraps up and you find out that their eternity is what Jesus 
says, will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It won't seem so offensive then. Why didn't I just share the gospel? So we've got two groups of people in here, and we're going to wrap up. Two groups of people. One, you are the worker. You know what Jesus did with the disciples right after chapter 9? Sent them out. He sent the 12. And he didn't give them some big pep talk. Now, he told them it was going to be rough. It was not going to be easy. But as soon as he told them to pray for workers to be sent, he sent workers, right? So that's one group, the workers. Those who God is calling to send into the harvest. Your job, according to Scripture, is to pray. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out workers. But pray with a here am I, send me mentality. The second group, the harvest. You're one of those that you're just not sure, but you feel something on the inside. You feel like the Spirit is drawing you. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. Repent and you can be saved. That's good news. That's great news. Let's stand. Father, enlighten us this morning on which group we are. And Father, may your spirit draw us to where we need to be. Are we the ones praying that you will send out workers? And are we willing to work as soon as we pray that prayer? Or Father, are we one of those who've never confessed you as Lord? We believe you're God, but the demons believe and fear and tremble. Believing simply isn't enough. We confess that you are Lord. We believe that God raised you from the dead. We repent of the way we're going. We turn and go towards you. And we do it all through the drawing of the Holy Spirit. Oh God, work in this place this morning. You get all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you remain standing?